All right. Welcome, everyone. Really, really great to see everyone joining. So my name is Peta Kangalova, and I'm part of the IT Tech team and the IIT Secretariat. And today I'll be presenting together with Sarah Magda from UNDP and the IIT Secretariat. So first of all, just really wanted to thank you for joining and dedicating time to this. As we are aware, we are all dealing with a lot of different priorities. Um, and this webinar will be led again by me and Sarah, um, and we're all working remotely, and I hope you can all hear us well, but do shout out in the chat box if there are any issues. So again, uh, the webinar is on progress updates and consultation on COVID-19. Just very few things to mention. I think most of you are probably now familiar with the use of Zoom, but just to say you will all be muted by default. We are recording the session, so there's an opportunity to then share the recording with others who are not able to join, or you can look back at it. And we've set the webinar for an hour and a half. There'll be a plenty of time for discussion and, con and consultation, so we might even finish earlier, depending on how in-depth the discussions and the conversation will be. Um, and just to reiterate again, uh, welcome to anyone new joining, or this is our third webinar um, looking at IIT COVID-19 data and guidance. So if you are new to, to this, welcome. And if you are rejoining us again, and you were involved previously, then thank you very much again for dedicating that time. So moving on briefly to the agenda and what we plan on covering uh, in today's webinar. So first of all, uh, what I would cover is uh, just an update on progress today. So at the start of March, like where, what has happened and where we are uh, now. And then the focus of the uh, webinar is very much an analysis, an initial analysis that we did on the uh, data published to date. So Sarah will talk about some of the key findings. Um, we'll also flag some of the key data quality issues. So looking at the data and through engagement, what were the areas that were flagged and some data use challenges. Um, but very much what I wanted to flag is that the webinar is mainly, there'll be plenty of opportunity for discussion. So collaborating to identify solutions to, to improve the availability, the quality, some of the things that we've raised, so where improvements can be made, and, and very much the usability of the IATI COVID-19 data. And then I'll move on to next steps. So you'll hear quite a bit from us on the analysis, but the big chunk of this webinar is just really an opportunity to hear from you and engage in that discussion and suggestions for improvements and options. Good. Uh, so moving on on progress to date. So what I wanted to really reiterate here is I think really to flag the importance, but also I think the success of having, having the guidance. So in March uh, is when the initial IIT publishing guidance was launched and shared with the community. Uh, and then since then, thanks to everyone for very much being involved in that consultation with the community, with publishers and data users. So there was some update to the guidance and we run another webinar. And then in May, uh, we've launched a data access and use guidance that was published and the tools were updated. So following this guidance, um, you, were a, you're, you know how to identify the data. Uh, so those are kind of the, some of the key, the key areas of improvement since, uh, since March. And I think what I wanted to flag is that it is indeed a, a journey with the guidance and I think with any improvements that need to happen. So there are ongoing areas of making sure that we as a secretariat and tech team provide support to publishers and data users community. And I think individually, you know, in between publishers and users as well. Uh, very much proactively engaging with IATI members on data quality. I'll talk a bit about that of what we've done in June in terms of the IATI Secretariat directly reaching to members on uh, their COVID-19 data and consulting with the community and improving the quality of data and guidance. So it is an ongoing process and uh, it has been great to see 
the progress that has happened to date, but it's not, as you all know, a closed book and there are uh, areas of improvement that we do want to work together and support uh, that improvement. So moving on um, from here, I wanted to, um, for those of you who are newer, um, to just reiterate what was the guidance or what were the recommendations for organizations when preparing their IT data. So what are the elements and data fields for them to use? Um, and also um, how they were used so far. I think for those of you who might have read the guidance quite a few times already, how those elements were used. So first of all, the kind of simple recommendation and use was uh, to refer to COVID-19 in the activity titles and descriptions. Uh, and that was used by majority of organizations. Then looking at the data, Sarah will talk more about this, but uh, that was very kind of a simple and straightforward way for being able to follow the guidance. Um, there was a recommendation for use at transaction level as well as an option. It was used by a few organizations and then some challenges that we'll discuss later in this webinar. Then the other recommended uh, element for the guidance is the humanitarian scope element. So in that element, you can link to both emergency and appeal, and there were specific codes that were listed to, uh, to be used. Uh, and the recommendation to use for both development and humanitarian activities. Some of the um, some of the issues or some of the confusion was around when they should be used for development and humanitarian and how they can be used at transaction level. But it was great to see that uh, with the guidance and those codes, there was a lot of publishers that were already using them. Then another recommended element as part of the guidance was the um, the humanitarian flag. So that's what we call in IATI and an attribute. Um, so specifying whether they are humanitarian. And that was very much um, the reason for including it in the COVID-19 guidance is that's important that any humanitarian activities are identified. And I think a bit more clarity uh, is what some organization need is on the relevance to COVID-19. Um, and last but not least, the tag element was another uh, option and recommendation for organizations to use very much only in cases where um, they have development activities and are unable to use the humanitarian scope. So looking at the data so far, again, Sarah will pick up on this, we've not, uh, there were no organizations using it, so this was very much as an option for those that weren't able to use the humanitarian scope. Uh, and what was really, really critical, I think, to the publishing guidance is a, a call for very timely and comprehensive data. So being able to identify at least on a weekly, uh, on a weekly basis, and we'll, we'll go in more detail on this. But here I just wanted to yeah, at least kind of give a key highlight of what were the areas of the guidance that organizations were looking at and followed. And it was really, really great to see that um, a lot of you we're using the guidance in preparing the data um, and I'll move on and allowing us to, yeah, allowing users to, um, to be able to use the data following those, following those elements. Um, I will now uh, hand over to Sarah who will move on from, you know, using this, using this guidance, how, uh, what the kind of initial analysis on COVID-19 is showing us. Thank you, Petya. Um, so building on what Petya has sort of gone through, um, in order to um, analyze um, the data published so far, um, we retrieved all of the activities and transactions um, that included these um, COVID-19 specific values um, as it's recommended to do the publishing guidance. And we retrieved this data um, on the 17th of June um, using the registry um, and so, of course, we recognize that the number of activities continues to increase. I checked this morning, it's 1833, but um, this analysis was conducted as of um, 17. You know. um, and so we collected, uh, we, we retrieved this data and conducted the analysis to enable us to kind of get a better sense of what data has been published, um, how the guidance is being followed, 
um, and also to, to help us identify some data quality issues that we have since um, engaged with a number of publishers on. Um, so I, I will just go through sort of some highlights of the analysis. Um, and I think that uh, folks that had registered by last Friday, we did publish a new post that, that goes into a bit more detail on the analysis. Um, and, and we'll certainly share that after this webinar as well. Um, but if you're interested in more details, um, there are some in that in that new post, but I'll go through the, the highlights here. Um, so, so looking at the ways in which publishers have followed the guidance, um, we can see that um, 53 publishers so far, um, as of 17 June, um, had included the COVID-19 specific values in their activity, um, with there being 1376 COVID-19 related activities published to the ADI. Um, um, which means that like to determine their, you know, a COVID-19 related activity, they would be using any um, of these items and in the table. So the title, description, humanitarian scope, tag, transaction description, um, and at least one or more of the, the transactions. Um, and then we can also see that there are 1768 um, transactions that include COVID-19 in the transaction description description. Um, so these, in order to qualify under this category, would um, have to include specifically the COVID-19 in the transaction description. Um, so from looking at the table, you can kind of see that, um, as Petya mentioned, um, most publishers are, are using the activity title or activity description, um, a handful using humanitarian scope and transaction description, and so far, um, none using the tag. Um, so we can move on to the next slide and take a closer look at um, the activities. So um, taking a, a closer look at the, I think we can move on to the next slide. If that's possible. Great. Um, so taking a closer look at the 1376 activities that, that have been published, um, you can see that about like more than half of these activities were published by multilateral organizations. Um, and 87% were published by the, these 10 organizations that are listed in the table. Um, so this kind of gives you a sense of the top 10 um, in terms of the number of activities. Um, of course, important to keep in mind in looking at the number of activities that each publisher sort of defines activity differently. So you, the number of activities might appear larger than you would expect, um, but just because um, each publisher defines that a little bit different. Um, if we could go to the next slide. So um, we also saw in looking at the data that there are 405 organizations that are listed as implementing COVID-19 related activities. Um, and in looking at this data, we could kind of identify some potential data quality issues there. Um, so you can see the, the sort of top 10 um, organizations listed as implementing COVID-19 related activities. Um, but you can also see that there are 125 for which um, an implementing organization name was not listed. Um, and also it appears that um, a number of publishers are reporting themselves as implementing organizations. So um, that, that potentially raises the question um, uh, of, of whether um, there is an additional implementer or whether, or whether that information is accurate. So something important to explore. So we are able to see the actual traceability in the flow of funds. Um, and then you can also see the, um, the top 10 recipient countries there, um, which also helps us to identify um, a potential data quality issue uh, of a number of activities not including the recipient country. Um, so we, there's a lot of data to explore, but these are a couple of the, the highlights. Um, if we can move on to the next slide. So then, um, Obviously, um, looking at the COVID-19 related activities, um, it's difficult to assess um, how much of the resources under those activities are specifically uh, addressing COVID-19. Um, it's not really possible to assume that the full um, bucket of resources within an activity are, are addressing COVID-19. Um, and so in order to be able to, you know, like definitively and reliably sort of assess the amount of money going to COVID-19, it's, it's needed to look specifically at the transactions that have been tagged as COVID-19. So this 
this kind of analysis kind of sets up some of our discussions later um, on how potentially we could better um, identify um, the money um, in the Gaudi data that is specifically addressing COVID-19. Um, but kind of looking at the data, we can see that nine publishers are identifying um, COVID-19 related transactions. Um, and looking at these transactions, we can see that um, about 297 um, million US dollars um, have been recorded in outgoing commitments. Um, but just to sort of put this in the overall picture, there's about 14, um, more than 14 billion um, that are recorded in COVID-19 related activities, but it's only the 297 million that we're kind of really able to say for sure um, is addressing COVID-19. Um, the same applies to, to the disbursements. So it's 166 million recorded in, in the transactions, um, but um, more than 6 billion um, recorded overall in COVID-19 related activities. Um, so kind of looking at this data, we can see that, um, you know, we still have a challenge of trying to figure out how, how to better do this potentially in the data so that um, we can really see um, the amount of resources that are being used to, to address um, COVID-19. Um, so we can shift to the next slide. Um, and then looking a little bit closer at the, the, this resource data, looking at the COVID-19 um, related transactions. Um, we can see the, the recipient countries for um, both commitments and disbursements. Um, so um, again, this kind of highlights um, the challenge of, of there not being um, recipient countries um, included um, for, for quite a bit of the resources um, in both commitments and disbursements. So um, at this point, I just, I, we just wanted to give a brief overview. Like I said, there's more information, um, more details available in the news post, but I will hand um, back to Katya to, to go through some um, of the data quality issues and publishing challenges in more detail. Great. Thanks, Sarah, and hope everyone found that useful. And as Sarah said, it's all on the website. So. What I'll move on to is some, you know, some of the data quality issues or challenges that we've seen. But I think I do want to start again, you know, looking at the analysis and, and everything, and just to thank everyone for being very responsive. And I think we can definitely see there's a lot of data out there growing every single day. And there's a real opportunity there with the data. But what we do want to focus on is, you know, improvement. So what are the current issues and challenges? And then we will go into the discussion of some of those challenges and possible options of how those can be improved. So on this slide, what uh, what I've added here is, as you've heard from Sarah, we've looked at all publishers and the analysis, but also in June, the IATI Secretariat reached to all our men members. So uh, obviously not all members are uh, publishers or providing data, but those who are, we've contacted all uh, 64 organizations and we've had really good responses, which was really useful. So we've looked in more detail at the data to understand, you know, where there are challenges, where there are issues to be addressed, but very much, I think, to hear and understand what are your internal challenges and, uh, and you know, how organizations collaborate and addressing them. So what, yeah, what we found in terms of data quality issues. So first of all, as, as I mentioned, you know, using COVID-19 in titles and description was kind of easiest and, you know, pragmatic approach. But looking at the data, there were some inconsistencies in that use of COVID-19. So for instance, missing the dash or missing or using just coronavirus. So there were different variations of how that's used in the text field. Um, and of course, um, as you would expect with the with using just COVID-19, you would also get some like false positives. So you'd get activities where they'll be picked picked up where, you know, in the title it could have said, you know, suspended due to COVID-19. So those are the things to, you know, going forward to think of options. There were some errors, so it was really great to see that organizations were already using the humanitarian scope and the codes that were available and out there. But again, some errors in actually not directly using the codes, you know, specifying it's an emergency or an appeal, but then um, including just COVID-19. 
I think one important one is really the timeliness. I think there's a really big call for, uh, you know, for timely data, specifically in responding to the pandemic. So what we've heard from uh, organizations is that at the moment they can do updates on a monthly or a, or a quarterly basis, obviously with a few exceptions. And I think where they can be daily or weekly, but the majority from what we've heard, and I think there were different reasons for that. That would be interesting to hear from uh, from participants as well, because um, from a data use side, I think that's a really that's a really crucial one. Um, on the comprehensiveness of the data, again, you know, inclusion of recipient countries, um, implementing organizations not included, um, you know, those are kind of important important areas of previously reflect on, um, you know, having a full, the full information and having comprehensive data um, to be able to use for whatever analysis or searches you're doing. Um, and also, yeah, there was indeed looking at, you know, the data and engaging with organizations, limited inclusion of COVID-19 values at transaction level. And I think there, um, there are different, different reasons for that. And we'll go in a discussion which will be really useful um, specifically on, on how that, you know, can be improved. And then some of the publishing challenges, which it's, I thought it's really important to flag as we understand that, you know, that some organizations, they did want to, you know, in the long term, for instance, include humanitarian scope and so, and so forth, but they require changes to your internal systems and realizing that takes time or might not be a viable solution. So, you know, some of those issues, how can they be addressed as well internally? Uh, complexity of guidance. So obviously you've listened now to the multiple options that are available to include COVID-19, which again gives flexibility to, to organizations is what they're able to refer. And I think as the kind of guidance matures in the data and all of that, there could be ways of having more streamlined and preferred ways but it's important that the options and the flexibility is there. Um, some of the challenges that we'll discuss as well in a bit in, in, in the sessions where we go into options were around, um, you know, the, where in the guidance you refer to development and humanitarian activities. And I think that was specifically in relation to the use of uh, the humanitarian scope um, and if and when to use that like whether you use internal or more country specific ones. Um, and last but not least, one of our discussion topics in the second will be about the identification of repurposed funding. Um, you know, I think that's a question that's asked a, a lot and there's some options of how that can be linked in the data. Uh, that would be really, really good to discuss in a second and uh, think of different improvements. Um, I'll hand over very briefly to Sarah to talk about, you know, building on this, what were some of maybe the, the challenges on the data, on the data use side, and then we'll move on to the more practical discussion. Thanks, Katia. Um, so, of course, um, while the amount of the data available um, and the quality of the data continues to improve day by day, of course, one of the, the goals of this webinar is to Think about some of these challenges in the context of what this means for um, the accessibility and usability of the data. Um, so I think it's helpful to kind of connect the dots here to some of the, the challenges that we've highlighted and what that means for, for data use. Um, so, so certainly um, it could be some of these issues could present challenges for finding um, COVID-19 related activities. Of course, if the activities are not yet published, that speaks to the timeliness of the publication data um, if, if activities are published but um, the guidance isn't followed then it also makes it difficult for a user to to know how to find um, a COVID-19 related activity um, and um, if there are inconsistent use or um, errors in the use of following the guidance so you know this is something that as Petia mentioned we attempted to sort of identify and engage with some publishers on and have have so far resolved um, a number of issues um, to, to make sure that um, the, the quality of the use of the following of the guidance is good so that, that users can find these activities. Um, and then uh, potentially the omission of the recipient country. So 
So if you're, you know, a partner, if you're um, in a country and you're trying to identify um, which activities are being um, implemented or resources is flowing into your country and there's no act, there's no recipient country listed, of course, you're not going to find that activity when you search for your country. Um, so, so that obviously um, pre presents a challenge for, for data use. Um, also, uh, a challenge for data use is if, if tra transactions are not specified as COVID-19 um, related, then it, it's difficult for data users to precisely identify the amount of money that's actually being used to address COVID-19. Um, so if a country was trying to look at the, the resources that are being channeled into their country to address COVID-19, um, and um, they don't have that precise information, it's then difficult to determine how much, um, how much resources to, to allocate, national resources to allocate to COVID-19 without that precise information. Um, so for real-time data use, um, that kind of decision is particularly useful. Um, and then, of course, um, something that we continue to talk about um, is, is the ability to identify the flow funds and uh, what we call traceability. Um, and so including specific information is, is critical for that, for users to be able to see where the money originates and where it goes and, you know, the results of, of that effort. So um, making sure that, you know, the um, implementing organization name is included is for that. Um, also um, using um, the provider and receiver organizations um, at the transaction level is also critical. Um, for enabling the traceability and the ability to, to follow the flow of funds um, for the um, activities that are addressed with COVID-19. Um, so I think um, it's just important to always kind of keep in mind, um, you know, like that, that we're trying to create solutions so that, you know, like this is possible for publishers to publish this information, but it also enables um, users to access and use the information as well. So I will hand back over to for the discussion. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Um, so what we want to do now is look at, you know, we talked about the, the data that's out there and I think a few of the challenges, a few of the areas where we've actually had questions and that would be good to have this discussion with everyone in the, in, in the webinar to kind of talk through what the current options and like some other possible options. And just to say before I start with this one, so that we've split them into three separate areas. So first of all, which I'll start with is about identifying resources. Then in a bit, we'll move on about the question of repurposed funding. And then the last discussion will be on the use of the humanitarian scope and the different codes that we are referring where I know that's a bit more specific, I think for some of the like multilateral organizations using them. So just so that you know, we'll kind of split them into three three different uh, discussions, three different questions. And um, and I'll now run through the kind of the questions, like some of the options, and pose for maybe for 10 minutes so that we can hear from you what are your preferred options, what are the kind of challenges, how internally you are, you are using that. Um, and summarize. And just to say, I think the aim very much of the webinar is to for us to be able to facilitate that discussion as we currently have recommended uh, recommended um, um, suggestions. But this is an opportunity to to have that you know have that initial um, initial conversation with with all of you joining today. So starting with the first question. Um, how can we identify resources specifically allocated to COVID-19? So this came up quite a bit, I think also working with members, we've already talked about, and at the moment, the, the recommended guidance is to include COVID-19 in transaction description. There were a few organizations where, whether it's that due to their internal systems or other reasons where that was not really an option. So some of the other potential options um, that would be good to hear views at the moment. And there were already some of them mentioned on this because as well as during the consultation is whether uh, first and second, whether a tag and humanitarian scope can be used at transaction level. It would be good to, uh, I think if we have um, Andy and USAID, I think specifically looked at this to jump in later. 
So first of all, uh, such an alternative would require an IAT upgrade, and the reason for that is that that's quite a substantial change. So if you're adding an activity, but also at transaction level, obviously there are interlinkages and there aren't any plans for, for an upgrade um, at the moment. So that's something, you know, in the future could be added, but at the moment it's not really a practical suggestion. Um, there was discussion as well as the use of um, transaction address. So what that is, is very much an internal reference that organizations use for their transactions. Um, and it's, its very purpose is not to, you know, specifically link to COVID. It will be interesting to hear if already in your internal system for some transactions there is such a reference. But it wasn't seen from current consultation as a, you know, very uh, as well uh, practical practical option because the purpose of this internal reference is something quite different in your internal system. Uh, some organizations have suggestions for using an extension. So what that is in IIT is, you know, in addition to, um, you know, the IIT standard and all the elements, there's an opportunity for organizations if they deem appropriate to add an extension that's specific to something that they, they reference. Um, we as a kind of set of secretariat and tech team, you know, we wouldn't recommend that as the go-to option because it is not part of the standard, but it is an option if organizations would want to use. And then some suggestions, I think, from um, as well people participating today is, you know, options of using parent and child activities. So being able to, um, if you know, in your child activities, referring to those transactions. I think this again adds quite quite a bit of complexity of the linkages between parent and child activities or how that's referred into your internal system, but it's again a, an option. Um, so yeah, very much would want to hear views on this. Um, the recommendation at the moment is very much use transaction description and the COVID-19, but those are some other other suggestion options where that is not possible. And then the second area where we would want to hear back from you is some suggestions on quantifying percentage of funds allocated within an activity to um, COVID-19. So uh, I think there was support from uh, like some multilaterals, like not really strong. I think um, if you have UNICEF joining, it would be good to hear from them. Um, but this very much uh, is using the sector percentages. So referring to COVID using uh, the sector element. Uh, and I think the kind of drop down from that is that it's less precise data, it presents challenges for data use. And also the sector element, kind of the content of it is not specifically to refer to COVID. So I think some people participating in this webinar would also might have been involved in like OECD DAC meetings where there are discussions of where the relevance for COVID-19 is to be included, whether there are any changes to uh, some of their purpose codes. But I think there's quite a lot of um, pushback on this as well, um, because uh, you know it could be health and um, and other um, other sector codes. So the moment our sense from uh, from the consultations that there's no strong support for that, uh, but I would now open the floor for. Um, from participants to, you know, to hear, especially those of you, I think we've already been in touch via email on um, some of the, the challenges and some of the of other options. So if you're not able to include COVID-19 in the transaction descriptions, uh, what, what, what what's your um, um, support for any of the other alternative options and how that works currently for your organization? So if people want to raise hands, then I'll just unmute you and you'll be able to speak. Great. Uh, I think we heard. Hi, Charlotte. Hi. Hello. If you just introduce yourself and which organization you're representing, then um, oh, okay. it'd be great to hear from you. So, hello, uh, my name is Charlotte Arquist uh, from FAO. Um, I have a question on the concept of 
COVID-19 related um, because uh, I understand the requirement to identify within an activity how much or what uh, of that okay. activity is COVID-19 related. But I was wondering, is there a definition of what we mean by COVID-19 related? Because I've had a lot of questions from my colleagues okay. about that. Because mm -hmm. um, there is, of course, uh, possibly a wish to consider what you're doing to be COVID-19 related. And uh, the definition could be as broad or as narrow as you want, really. Mm -hmm. um, so I wondered, is, is there a definition somewhere that I have missed or... Um, is it something that you're wanting to, to develop or is it voluntarily up to up to everybody to interpret? Yeah, good question. I'll address that and wait for others to uh, yeah, raise their hand. Very good question. And it, IATI doesn't have specific guidance on what you define. So that will be more on the publisher side to decide uh, whether the activity is, you know, whether it's allocating funding and so there isn't a restrictive guidance on what uh, related to COVID-19 so I think it's kind of the wider spectrum and is the decision for the publishers to decide I know for instance if you are uh, a lot of the organizations joining they'll be reporting for instance to OECD DAC and CRS where there are much more kind of you know strict rules and discussions of what should be covered where in IATI, you know, it goes beyond official development assistance and it is the, um, yeah, it is the judgment of the organization. So it could be any type of activities that, um, that your organization is providing. And, and I think that's actually an interesting one where I've heard from organizations like internally, like at the moment, it, it seems like there are loads of processes in your internal systems, but also decisions of you know, how to um, to identify if this project or specific funding um, is a linking to COVID-19. But yeah, the bottom line is we don't have a kind of specific, it's for organizations to make that decision. Hope that answers your question. Uh, and we have Justin who's raised his hand. Hi, Justin. Hi, um, so my name is Justin Sen from UNHCR. Just uh, two comments on these potential options. Uh, first one on option number three to use this uh, transaction reference attribute. I, I don't think it aligns very closely to the description of that mm -hmm. attribute within the IATI standard. Mm -hmm. And I'd be a little bit disappointed if you use it because I'm just starting publishing actual um, transaction references. So it's designed to be a reference to uh, within your financial system to that transaction. So I was just starting to publish that. Um, and if you interrupt them, then they'd be disappointing. But anyway, the, just that. This, the second one is, I was wondering if there's an option six of using the sector um, breakdown. Now, one issue with this is you can either put a sector breakdown at the activity level, or you can put it at the transaction level. But if you put it at transaction level, you have to put it on every transaction according to the current standard. That, that would be difficult, but I'm wondering if it might be a slight modification to the standard where you can have tra um, sector breakdowns of a particular vocabulary at the activity level and then um, at a, of a different vocabulary at the transaction level. So just, a, just a thought. I'm not sure whether it's the best idea or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Over. Mm -hmm. Good. No, and, and I think I would start by saying there isn't an ideal. I think that's what we wanted to start. I think the simplest and what we recommend solution now is the using COVID-19 in transaction description. And if not able to do that for those organizations, just thinking through some of the, in terms of transactions at REF, I would totally agree. I think it serves different purpose. Obviously it is an option and that's why I wanted to, I, what we want to do is just very much hear from you. And I think what I'm hearing from you, Justin, is that's not feasible. I agree, it's not what it's set to do, but it's kind of getting the knowledge from you of how you use that, um, how you use that at REF. So that's really useful to know where it's it basically, it's not a, you know, it's not something that you're internally using and it wouldn't be a good option um, 
And then in terms of, yeah, I think that looks to kind of quantifying percentages again. I think that that's quite the complexity to um, how, you know, how the COVID, how the reporting would work. Uh, and if you're adding, um, I think your point was about a specific, uh, if you're using vocabulary 99, and that might go too technical for some, but uh, that would need to be a self-defined one and it would need to use within that vocabulary um, for, you know, for all the transactions. So, um, yeah, so at the moment, I think that's why I was saying it's probably not strong support at the moment for this. Obviously, the OECD DAC um, vocabulary, for instance, is used and in the future there is such a code, then um, that could be a possible option. Mm -hmm. Any other inputs from people or any strong views on, um, I think I mainly spoke to, yeah, I think UNICEF as well, I don't know, Jira, if you have any other other thoughts. And I think this is very much to yeah, to hear from you on other, you know, alternatives um, and how internally you're referring. Uh, I think Sarah wanted to bring back Sarah. Hi everyone, if I could just um, maybe pose a, a, another question in line with the, the, the questions that Petty has already raised. Um, but I guess obviously the key challenge here is that um, we know that it's not possible for some publishers, for example, to include COVID-19 in the transaction description. Um, and so I think, you know, like, because it's critical to be able to identify transactions, um, as COVID-19 related to be able to really precisely say something about the resources being spent on COVID-19. Um, we really want to, you know, better understand what other options might work for, you know, a, 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 maybe a substantial group of publishers um, if the transaction description is not something that potentially would work for you. So I might pose the question if anybody who's not able to use COVID-19 in the transaction description you know, would have a, um, would be able to do any of these other options. I would be interested in, in, in your thoughts. Because um, obviously the ultimate goal here is to potentially, um, you know, have more transactions specifically identified as COVID-19 related, related. So that's kind of like the overall goal um, in terms of what we've seen as um, feedback from, from users and also from the community. Um, so, so trying to think through the best option, like, is there another option or is there another option that we should be recommending as part of the guidance? Um, so I don't know if any publishers that specifically had issues, including COVID-19 in the transaction description might have um, any, any inputs here. I know that there's some people joining by a phone who probably won't be able to raise their hand. So if anyone would want to bring um, any views, feel free to speak now. Okay, we have two hands. Hi, okay, let's go first with Mark. Hi, Mark. Hey, Petia. Um, yeah, first of all, thanks a lot for this analysis. I think this is it's super good and really interesting to see um, all of this um, and um, yeah I know thanks for putting this together it must have been quite a lot of work across lots of different publishers at short notice as well um, in, in terms of the options here um, so I think I mean from the the work um, that I was doing on the COVID-19 prototype with the grand bargain and I put a link in the chat if anyone else hasn't seen that yet as well it goes to the USA data specifically but you can you can click to reset it um, um, yeah, so we, we, we sort of initially working with USA data and then a bit with UNHCR data, we went through a couple of these different options that are listed listed there at the moment. Um, and currently, um, we're, I think, using um, data which has the free text description COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Although there's a little bit more specific um, transaction description that those uh, that US, USA and UNHCR and I think Slovenia are using, which includes mm -hmm. a specific light code. Um, I think um, this this works okay for now, um, and it's obviously nice to be able to see, um, you know, the the difference, um, you know, 
the total amount versus the COVID-19 specific thing. Um, but I would just caution on the use of the free text, um, only COVID-19 um, text. Um, I think for the mm -hmm. same reasons as you mentioned with the title and description, the fact that sometimes this can be used um, a bit inconsistently. Um, and I mean, I also found out the same thing with the with the the tool. If you see there, there are far far greater number of activities currently capturing the COVID nineteen mm -hmm. prototype, which I think is probably particularly due to UN uh, UNICEF, um, mm -hmm. where they they happen to use an acronym COVID, which means actually yeah, something do. else. Yeah. And so I think I'm going to go back after this and maybe maybe look at maybe making that a bit narrower. Um, um, but yeah, so I think this is one thing that I would sort of just caution, um, having something more specific than just this, this free text um, would be good. The, the, the reason also for that is that um, I found some cases where activity is said um, delayed due to COVID-19. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously you would want to exclude those activities, but it would be included if you just looked at COVID-19 in the transaction description, because also mm -hmm. often um, the, the data in the transaction description is often coming directly out of financial systems. Um, mm. And it just whatever happens, you know, happened to be entered into the financial system at that particular point in time. Um, it could include, you know, text COVID nineteen or whatever, but not, not actually mean this. This is COVID nineteen definitely. Um, so yeah, so that's just one thing I would say. So at the moment, the the, the transaction description it, it works okay. Um, although I think it would be good to have more specific guidance to say to use the the Glide code as well in, in the the way that USAID, UNHCR, and Slovenia have currently mm -hmm. um, published this. Um, but I think it's it would be good to have a slightly more sustainable um, or more structured solution going forward. Um, and I think my 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 suggestion was I think humanitarian scope is actually quite neat. Um, I know that there were discussions on discussed before about the fact that it includes the word humanitarian in the element name. Mm -hmm. And this might not always be humanitarian, but I think you know this is basically what is used for publishing glide codes, right? So I think it would be. Um, it would be a good solution going forwards, even though it would require a standard upgrade. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mark. And that's, I think that's really useful. And I, what I wanted to flag again is, you know, we, there is guidance out there and it, it, this is just thinking, you know, longer term, we're not expecting to find a solution and option now, but that's, that is basically thinking in, in the long run, is there a more um, streamlined way? And I think, thanks for your input, Mark, on kind of, talking about the humanitarian scope and actually in the third discussion point we we'll specifically talk about you know more clarity on that. Uh, Riza, you have your hand raised as well. Thanks Petia. Hi everyone, uh, Riza from UNDP. Since Sarah has raised that question in you know, any organization who is not uh, uh, you know position to publish at the transaction level, UNDP is one of that so I should <laughs> answer that. Uh, UNDP we don't publish uh, at the transaction level. And uh, when I'm looking at this option, we are already using the option five, not because of mm -hmm. uh, the COVID-19, because mm -hmm. we always publish uh, data in multiple uh, hierarchies. So we have parent mm -hmm. and child already. So what we did was when we created the guidelines, we provided the internal guidelines for our project managers, any activity which is uh, relevant to COVID-19, any new activity, we asked them to create an output, which is the child activity mm -hmm. in our IIT data set. So yeah. in IIT for UNDP, basically uh, the activity which has been created for COVID-19, all the transaction related to that goes to COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So that's why UNDP will not be um, uh, tagging anything at the transaction level. So by default, mm -hmm. when you create, but I mean, by the uh, by default at uh, in IIT standard. So once you tag something for the activity, which is not everything for the transaction, only if any specific transactions are not then, then only you have to specifically tag the transaction, right? So anything mm -hmm. which we have uh, published under COVID-19 activity, which goes to COVID-19 related. Having said that, we do have some uh, examples that you know we repurpose the activities which were running earlier. So what we did was basically we asked the project managers to identify going forward if the project is only going to serve for COVID-19 related, then only in our internal system we are linking it to COVID-19. In other words, there are a few activities which we have repurposed, but not fully, but we are not publishing that 
to IIT mm -hmm. as a COVID-19 related activity because internally mm -hmm. we don't have a mechanism to identify the relevant transaction. So why I uh, explain this one because some of the organization, uh, the challenge is not to publish even to identify which one is COVID-19 related mm -hmm. or not. Uh, for example, UNDP, for those activities which I explained, we don't have an internal uh, mechanism to identify if it is only partially contributing to COVID-19, mm -hmm. we don't have a system. So that's why we are anything which we publish to IIT, if the activity is fully contributing to IIT only, we are publishing as COVID-19 related. Mm -hmm. So in that, uh, mm -hmm. in that sense, uh, the most suitable for us is the fifth, but I know that, you know, that is not an option for yeah. most of the organization and which I wouldn't also prefer if you are not already publishing in multiple hierarchies. I agree with the uh, Mark. So I would go with uh, option one or two because it will be in line with the already what you have prepared because you have mm -hmm. already prepared at the activity level. So it will be, it will go with the standard like we normally do it for all the other elements also, if it is at the activity level, then we can uh, link it at the activity level. If not, we can specify at the transaction level. So I would uh, I would go for one or two, uh, mm -hmm. and I wouldn't really uh, suggest the third one also, uh, that you know, you yeah. should, we shouldn't be using the reference which, which has been already you know, prepared for a, a different purpose. Thank you. Thank you very much, Riza. And yeah, really good to hear. Um, you know, suggestions for more practical long term options. And I think interesting what you were saying about internally, you know, not, you know, having to make the decision of whether it's fully or not. And I think that's something that if others are obviously there are different forums in which publishers, you know, you can engage in between like different organizations of, you know, how you're addressing those, how you're addressing those challenges, because it does look to me, I think definitely through engagement and emails that we've had is that there's still quite a lot of internal, um, you know, internal decisions to be made before, you know, the, the data is out there and linking, I think, to Charlotte's question on um, um, how you identify that. And to your point on repurposed activities, I think that's actually our second discussion point that I wanted to, uh, I wanted to move into. But I'll just give uh, one more minute to see if anyone else has any other thoughts before we move on to the, um, to the next slide where we talk about options for the repurposed and diverted funds. Hi, Jura. Hi. Uh, Hi. Hi. Oh, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate the, the, the webinar. Thanks for the detailed analysis and all that. Um, so just uh, one clarification and then maybe a couple points from UNICEF. Um, uh, again, sorry, my name is Jiri Jin. I'm from uh, UNICEF. Um, so the cl clarification question is, uh, in terms of the, the text, the COVID-19 text uh, in activity uh, title description, as well as the mm -hmm. transaction description. So um, as I understand, there can be different variations of COVID-19. Um, so mm -hmm. if, if, if there's a, a list somewhere that could be helpful. I think for from uh, our perspective, we have guidelines to our country office when they enter the their result structure in the system. So we can incorporate this in the guideline. However, we do not uh, change or massage the data. Um, so it is up to the office, however, they what they enter in our corporate system. So um, that's one. And the other uh, a couple comment is on the transaction. Uh, so um, what in our system, we are introducing a COVID-19 tag. So for every transaction, um, so if, if it's COVID, you can, the office can turn on and off the COVID-19 tag. So going forward, we are planning to publish that. So at the transaction level, we should clearly uh, indicate whether this is COVID-19 uh, or, or not. So I think that's uh, pretty much aligned with mm -hmm. the current guideline, right? Um, in terms of mm -hmm. uh, more detailed information uh, for COVID-19 at the transaction level. Um, mm -hmm. The second one is I, I completely understand the concerns of using the sector percentage of to publish the, the percentage of found 
uh, are allocated to COVID-19 within an activity. Again, the sector um, is either at activity le level or mm -hmm. at the transaction level, not at both. So I guess my question is, I would like to, to hear from um, the secretary and, and the other organization. So um, I guess from our perspective, using the sector percentage is just the interim solution um, until we, we find an optimal permanent solution for this because this is a very important information. We need to make it uh, uh, available for, uh, for users. So, so um, I guess, because uh, we are in the schema 2.02, not yet 2.03. So some of the, like a tag, we, we can't really publish yet, but we are on track to, to upgrade. So the, the sector percentage is just the one way for us to, to publish that percentage in the interim. Uh, without a major uh, change to our uh, reporting system. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Yuri. So speaking to report, in terms of guidelines, so what I think if you're providing guidance to country offices, what we want is specifically using COVID-19 with the dash. I mean, we can send you, you know, what errors we've noticed where people are missing the dash or like, or just listing COVID. And I think especially in for instance, in UNICEF data, I think that's what Mark mentioned, that those were picked up, but that's great that you are providing this guidance. So I think if it is very much, you know, strictly saying add this in the title, then that would really help. Um, in terms of the internal tags that you have, really interesting to hear, and we've heard from others as well, that in your internal systems, there are those kind of tags that you're using. And I think it will be interesting if there is a tag in your system, whether that can then add, at the moment, the current suggestion and option is to add it into your transaction description. So I think if this tag is ticked, whether that can reflect in adding a text to the transaction description or that's not an option. Um, and on the sector, um, it, it is indeed an option. You're right. You have to use either an activity or um, or transaction or transaction level, um, and um, you know that that is again a choice of um, organizations and whether they do want to they do want to use that with a vocabulary ninety nine. Uh, but yeah, in terms of the versions of IAT, I think we had one or two questions on this. Um, I think version two or three only. We would encourage everyone to really you know upgrade to that version. It's not yet there. But I don't see a challenge in terms of the options listed there, except the use of the tag. Um, okay, so we'll have another point from Kalin, uh, yes, and then Kalin, we'll move hello. on to the next one. Hi, Hi there. I'm, I'm Kalin Garboni from uh, uh, European Commission. I'm talking mm -hmm. in, in name. Well, we are publishing in uh, in behalf of uh, uh, DG Defco. And DG near and FTI, so no, uh, not not for Echo, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, indeed we uh, we managed to upgrade to uh, uh, to, to standard two or three last week, uh, and we have we have implemented the, the tag uh, solution uh, at the activity mm -hmm. level. Uh, unfortunately, it was not uh, visible in uh, in in your analysis uh, since mm -hmm. the data was uh, a bit older. In the same time. Uh, uh, in the internal systems, uh, there are uh, activities that uh, have already the uh, COVID-19 uh, in the description or title, but this comes from uh, uh, from money, from the internal systems. Now, uh, mm -hmm. our preferred solution is to use the, the tag uh, element. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, while talking with the with the management, we are not really keen on. Uh, uh, altering or modifying the the description uh, mm -hmm. since uh, it uh, it might uh, modify the the meaning of the of the title for example uh, now the, the my question is also uh, if uh, yeah uh, if we have the tag uh, should you also um, push on on uh, on modifying the uh, the title and description or or not uh, and uh, and then for the uh, transactions. Uh, we are we are still investigating the a way of identifying because our tag is based on an internal marker, 
uh, which is still uh, at the very beginning of, of its life in the uh, in the internal system. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Kalin, for those uh, points. And yeah, interesting. So on the tag, at the moment, our suggestions for this use was very much if organizations are not able to use the humanitarian scope. So that'll be interesting to know, you know, if th that is the case, so to use for development activities. And it, it is an option, again, of um, of referring to you know using vocabulary 99 and specifying COVID-19. Um, it's very interesting to hear from you because I think you know the titles like we do encourage that you know the use in titles and descriptions because I think coming from you know a data use and being able to or more easily identify um, that is still the recommendations but I think you're not probably the first one kind of raising some of the challenges of how that links to the internal system so that's why i would say you know you need to be practical of what's currently feasible for you as the you know as the first option to implement and yeah just to check it was the tag mainly used because you weren't able to use humanitarian scope because it's development activity correct correct mm -hmm. so we, we couldn't okay, use so the, the right. combinations of uh, humanitarian activity yeah. this is why yeah. uh, echo managed to do mm -hmm. that because they do humanitarian uh, activities mm -hmm. And uh, this is why we we, uh, we put the pressure on on uh, yeah. upgrading in order to use the tag mm -hmm. and not altering the description. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So that's right. So I think yeah, on that that's great, and yeah, and that will be picked up. And then for yeah, titles and description, I think we do recommend. But if that's not feasible at the moment, it's you know it is a challenge we've heard from um, and, others. Okay. And the, yeah. the redundancy is not it's not a problem then when uh, uh, there is both the, the tag and the description. Yeah, no, so that's, I think, the point of kind of multiple options. And uh, the reason for that is, you know, if you're a data user and you go and look into the data, there are different areas that you can use to, to do that. But I think as a starting point of, you know, using that, that sounds good. Okay. Um, Anna, very briefly, and then I think I'll move on to the next discussion, which is about repurposed funding, and it's actually quite linked to what we are currently discussing. So if you want to bring your point, Anna, and uh, I'll move us on to the next discussion. Yeah, it's very, very brief. Thank you, Petya. Um, this is Anna from ActionAid UK. I just wanted to say that um, I personally don't agree with the standard upgrade because, I mean, if there are other good reasons for an upgrade, that's fine, but an upgrade yeah. just because internal systems are not, uh, you know, they cannot accommodate certain elements. I don't think that would be the right reason behind it. And also it would take too long for the standard upgrade to kind of come into effect and, and then for systems to be, up, you know, adapted to it in time for like getting any meaningful data on COVID. Uh, that's my point. Yeah, yeah. I think there are, you know, there are internal systems and challenges. And I think, you know, one of the benefits with the guidance is there is there are options, you know, into which um, um, you can follow. Um, so in terms of, you know, upgrading, I think the bottom line is we still want organizations to use the most recent version because obviously it has all the elements, but it is an internal decision for organizations of when and how they're able to do that or um, uh, why. So that's been really useful. And I think just to kind of try and summarize, I think there, there wouldn't be uh, one answer and one you know, solution that we can go ahead with now. But what we want is to summarize some of the discussions we've had. It seemed to me a bit more support on kind of going on a long-term option you know, with uh, the kind of tag and humanitarian scope. And then still there will be cases where um, organizations will be using uh, potentially, you know, sexy percentages, but quite strong opposition to using the at ref as a transaction element. And uh, obviously, parent and child activity, I think some organizations are already using this, but some, you know, some of their, um, for instance, with UNDP, some of their internal structure, but that adds another layer of complexity um, in also being able to use and understand the data and linkages. So, I'll move us on to the next discussion, which is very linked to this one. Um, and it's the question that 
uh, we are asked all the time is how to identify funding diverted and repurposed due to COVID-19. And I think that's a question that's, you know, critical data use question being asked so far. Um, what we want to really hear from you is, you know, how are the internal systems designating which funds have been diverted or repurposed? Like, is that already included? I think we already briefly picked up on this. So would it be possible to publish this information? Uh, you know, I've also heard from others where if there was a small amount, you know, being repurposed, actually internally the decision was not to yet publish those activities, but when there were new COVID-19 activities, for those to be added. So options here are very simple and uh, sound simple, but in terms of implementation, that's what we want to hear uh, back from you is, um, you know, splitting the activity. So if they are diverted or repurposed, then like can the activity then be split into two? Or just the amount that's actually diverted or repurposed, like identifying that at a transaction level. Um, so there isn't a you know a straightforward answer to that. So it'll be really good to hear from you internally at the moment how that's working in your systems. You know how are funds being repurposed on COVID-19, and are you able to reference that in the systems to uh, to identify um, those changes? I wait for people to raise their hands. We want to bring any views or I think maybe on the first one on uh, kind of sharing your experience with others who might be facing similar challenges like are you able to publish this information or how is that captured in your in your internal system? Any thoughts, any views? Look in the comments again. Uh, hi, Riza. Uh, hi, Patia. Uh, again, uh, yeah. Riza here. Uh, yeah, just uh, uh, like I. Uh, mentioned earlier so in UNDP we have the internal uh, system to identify which have been repurposed in the sense like you know mm -hmm. our guideline says that you know if you want to repurpose the funding which is already under one project what you can do is you can create an additional output and reallocate the money for that particular output which is mm -hmm. in your option the splitting the activity so it is mm -hmm. like you know, creating an additional uh, uh, child activity which we are doing mm -hmm. and uh, there are there have been instances where the entire activity which have been already uh, exist, existing activity have been repurposed going forward for covid-19 mm -hmm. in that case what we did was we included covid-19 in the title or description uh, additionally and then we have been we have asked the project manager to link it internally to link it to the covid marker so that you know it can be captured in iit so for sometimes you might see activities in iit which might have been uh, which, which might have uh, started prior to 2020 but you know you might mm -hmm. see covid 19 uh, in the description so that what, what it means is like, you know, going forward, that particular activity has been repurposed uh, completely to, uh, to serve uh, COVID-19 related uh, tasks. So that's how we have, uh, that's how UNDP internally managing how, uh, when, when we re repurpose the, the money uh, within the organization. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Reza. And that's really, I think, important because with all those discussions, it's about how would then users will be able to identify that. And you're right that I think even when doing this analysis, you know, we looked at all activities. I could even put uh, dates on that because from, you know, what you're saying is that in a current activity that might have started within that year, you would just um, amend and add uh, that to the um, activity 
description, which is yeah, which is great, and that would help. Any other thoughts from others? I think that's a that's a you know it's a it's a tricky one, and there isn't this you know very easy and straightforward answer. I think because of the differences and in how internally you will be uh, you will be doing that. But I think it's a very important one that I think it's it's asked it's being asked a lot. Um, asked. Any other thoughts or suggestions? I'll just give a few more seconds. And obviously, you know, this is, as, as I said, again, uh, talking through options, you know, those are the, the possible options that you can use at the moment. Um, and as things progress, um, we can keep on adding to that. Hi, Mark. Hi, Petia. Yeah. Um, uh, just one quick point. Um, I would um, definitely caution against splitting the activity. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's really important for activities in IIT to reflect um, actual, you know, units of aid in in publishers' own systems, mm -hmm. um, so that the identifiers remain the same. Because then you can use the same identifiers in different systems, and you know, you're always talking mm -hmm. about the same thing. And I think we had this discussion um, before on the humanitarian publishing guidance as well, and there was, I think, some some discussion on on this about, you know, it. The, the activity shouldn't actually be, be split along these lines um, and especially mm -hmm. in terms of things like um, reconciling data in, in information management systems or other kinds of systems as well I think it's really important for them to retain the same ID so um, um, yeah I, I wouldn't I wouldn't be in favor of splitting the activity I think um, I, I, I guess I guess the main question is here you know um, how you know what what exactly is meant by meant by this I guess you know so I guess it's funding that previously had been, you know, committed in previous years, but then actually gets spent on something else. Um, and I saw that, for example, in um, I definitely seen it in the Slovenia data, um, where for previous, I think, commitments from previous years, like from I think 2019, um, actually then had um, were marked as COVID-19 related because they were actually kind of repurposed. And I guess that could be one way in which. Maybe you don't need to have something, you know, a new specific way of saying particular sorts of things. Um, um, you know, aside from that it's COVID related, you know, you, you could basically kind of maybe infer this from the data if you had a kind of consistent methodology, methodology of how you would, um, how you would to basically, yeah, uh, funding pre-2020 that was identified mm -hmm. as COVID-19 was you know, understood to be repurposed, basically. So you can maybe have a, a methodology for doing it rather than necessarily having to have, you know, a specific new element or whatever it might be, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. I think there are always like downsides. It's not, it's not just the one way of, you know, for everyone to use or, you know, split the activity, but um, that is that is correct. Like, what are the decisions for like the diversion or repurposed, and at what time that's happening? Uh, Jiro first, and uh, yeah, Lisa, briefly back to you. Um. Hi. Um. So i um, I was just uh, while listening. I was just checking the guidance that we uh, issued to the offices. So. Mm -hmm we actually give them different options right so uh, mm -hmm. in our data we actually publish our outputs as IATI activity so for mm -hmm. our office they have the option of creating new COVID outputs uh, that means uh, we will have new COVID activity in IATI data mm -hmm. but also without changing their existing output they can also include the COVID activity uh, so that's basically the transaction level data in I, in our IIT data mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. so i guess this goes back to your slide which is the potential options right so we're not splitting yeah. the activity but however we are able to identify at a transaction mm -hmm. level which transaction are covid related uh, under the existing activity so yeah mm -hmm. i think that's uh, yeah. i just want to provide our perspective yeah yeah, and you're right, there are possible options and great to hear that, you know, that builds into this guidance to country offices so that it's, there is alignment. So that's really good to hear. Lisa, coming back to you quickly. Uh, thanks, Katya. Yeah, basically, I wanted to echo the same. So like I mentioned in the previous slide, so the splitting activity, basically, the, the strategy, what we are using the mechanism is to identify mm -hmm. their transactions. So 
uh, like I mentioned, if the entire activity has been repurposed, we don't really uh, split. So uh, we add the uh, description COVID-19 and then you know, we will link it to the uh, COVID-19 marker. But uh, specifically we split if the activity is still ongoing with the other purposes. And uh, let's say that you know, we have partially reallocate money for the COVID-19, which, which can be easily identified. Mm -hmm. So what we do is basically we do a budget revision and take out that money which has been allocated for other purposes in the previous year. So going forward, we take that uh, partial amount and create another level, another uh, activity, which is output. Uh, so we create and, you know, we uh, entirely use that particular activity for COVID-19. So how mm -hmm. it makes uh, the, the identification is for us is that, you know, even within that uh, existing activity, we are basically identifying the transaction, but not as uh, in IIT, not at the transaction level, but, you know, we since we can't uh, do that in you know, at the transaction level internally, so we take out the money and create the uh, new activity and we spend the entire amount for the COVID-19. So like I uh, mentioned mm -hmm. that you know, it is for us, for UNDP, it works as one of the option you showed that's a fifth option, but I know that you know, it will not uh, uh, work for most of the organization, especially those organization who are currently using single uh, hierarchy level. So it won't work. But you yeah. know, if you're using yeah. multiple hierarchy yeah. level, and if you already have the parent child, for, for it was it was easy for UNDP to adapt that mechanism and you know easily uh, publish the information at the activity level rather than uh, creating something yeah. new for the transaction level. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree, and I think that brings us again to kind of how activities are structured, and I think that would be really relevant to this discussion of how you'll be able to identify. I think really good points from people of like, it's not just, you know, just split the activities. They need to be, it's internally, that's how you're already like uh, changing. And I think the cases here we've had about, you know, uh, I think they're quite specific, you know, UNDP, UNICEF, uh, but it seems like if possible to identify transaction level, that's a good place forward. I'll move us on. I think that's been really useful and I hope people find that useful as well, just to hear what others are doing, you know, what challenges and what possible options there are. And I'll move us to the next discussion in kind of the next 10, 10 minutes to talk about a bit more about specifically the humanitarian scope element and some of the feedback and kind of clarifications and questions that we've had and uh, understanding that again, I think that's very much relevant for the UN agencies, multilaterals, um, but the questions that came up is, uh, as you know, from humanitarian scope, we're advising the use of GLIDE, the Global Identifiers and Humanitarian Response Plans. But what we want to know is for which activities are you using um, the humanitarian scope and whether you are additionally using your own internal codes. We've heard from some organizations that, for instance, they're not referring to or, um, you know, the uh, humanitarian, the global humanitarian response plan, and they might additionally have their own internal ones. Uh, but some of the uh, challenges, and I think the kind of distinctions that would be useful to hear from you is on, uh, you know, distinction between development and humanitarian um, activities and uh, further details on when code should be used. So those of you would know that for uh, GLIDE codes, we said use for both development humanitarian activities. The humanitarian response plan are very much, you know, managed by FTS and the code we've mentioned is, um, is referenced to the their global identifier. Um, but as we know, there are more country codes that will be um, as well coming in. So some organizations mentioned that they might already be able to refer to that and that's not something we currently have captured in the guidance. Uh, and maybe a bit around, you know, the use of humanitarian scope and clarifying that's currently only at activity level because I think that's, that was a bit of a confusion. So we have probably a bit less than 10 minutes on those specific ones on, you know, use of the humanitarian scope element. So how you use that for development and humanitarian, the GLIDE codes, were there any challenges? I think we already heard from, uh, from Colleen and EC that they've used the tag for specifically that reason because they weren't able to use that. Uh, but just getting a bit more input and thinking of, you know, ways in which we can um, clarify or update the guidance specifically in that area of humanitarian scope and the use, um, the use of the codes 
And let me just check. I don't think we have, yeah, Nick from FTS, but yes, that would be useful to hear from people how you're using them and any of those challenges. And whether you're referring to any other codes. Yeah, please raise hands if, if you have any input on this. I'm aware that, you know, might not be relevant for absolutely everyone, but the feedback we got uh, is just a bit more on the clarity on the development and humanitarian, how the codes are used in relation to that. And yeah, direct question is any of you are actually already referring or you have activities that might be referring to appeals that are country specific? Let me see. Or is everyone quite tired as it's the end of the day? And that's, I think, quite a in depth. Uh, discussion. Hi, Reza. Um, go, go ahead, Reza. Uh, uh, thanks, Mark. Uh, just uh, more, uh, UNDB is one of the organizations we are still struggling to convince uh, our management that you know, we can use the humanitarian scope for all the COVID-19 activities. Mm -hmm. um, just to add something to that uh, issue that, you know, why we are not comfortable using humanitarian scope because most of the uh, UNDP activities, COVID-19 related activities are not really humanitarian mm -hmm. nature rather than, you know, development nature. So we agree with that, uh, the identity, uh, sorry, the guidelines, because we can still differentiate the uh, humanitarian development by using the flag. That's what uh, currently we are using it, you know, for example, uh, initially we were thinking that, you know, we will uh, add uh, uh, for those activities which are humanitarian, we will add the flag, and for all the other activities, we can add the glide code. But then, you know, later there were questions raised that you know, when we publish something on the humanitarian scope, which is generally used for the humanitarian activities, mm -hmm. so using that, you know, that we declare that you know that particular activities is in in humanitarian nature, which is kind of that you know a serious in the UNDP because we don't want to claim most of those mm -hmm. activities are in humanitarian nature because we are not a humanitarian agent, agency in that sense, right? We are a development agency. So that's the one of the pending issue when it comes to UNDP uh, COVID-19 data publication also, because currently we are including the glide numbers only for the only for those activities which are identified by the project manager as humanitarian. So we are not mm -hmm. systematically including glide number to all the activities. So just wanted to, I, I want to hear from the other uh, agencies also, especially who are humanitarian. What do you think that, you know, by including this glide number, do you think any other places where it will, it will have potential or to say that you know negative impact and you know declaring this activity as COVID-19 which can be picked in other platforms or some other use cases mm -hmm. that you know this idea uh, this activity can be falsely identified as a humanitarian response rather than a development in nature just want to raise that so that you know, I want to hear from the others also what they think about it thanks Patia thank you Reza Mark up to you Um, yeah, so just um, quickly on this point, um, I, so I, on the on the COVID-19 uh, visualization, I also did um, a coding of which activities were humanitarian development and mix or unspecified, um, according to a methodology that I, I more or less picked up off of a discussion from IIT Discuss. Um, and in particular, you can see that the World Bank has um, mm -hmm. used their glide codes for all of their, acti for all of their COVID-19 activities. Um, and some of those activities they flagged as humanitarian and others they haven't used the humanitarian flag at all. And for me, this is the, you know, I, I think it would be really good to have more um, clarity on exactly how to use the humanitarian flag to say if an activity is humanitarian or development or a mix or whatever. Um, but I think this is how you should say that an activity is humanitarian. I think the humanitarian scope element, it doesn't say that it is humanitarian. I think it's, it's you know, just the name of the element in the XML, I think, um, um, I think it. I think if there were stronger guidance to explaining that this doesn't necessarily mean it's humanitarian, it's just that it, it generally would be humanitarian because it's generally using glide codes. 
Um, I, I think that that would be maybe that would work if there was more clarity for publishers in that sense, because you know people generally shouldn't be looking at the XML anyway. They should be using some kind of an interface to access the data. Um, but the World Bank is the best example so far. Of, you know, a mostly development agency that sometimes has humanitarian stuff that has used the humanitarian flag to highlight if it's humanitarian or development, but has used the Glide code consistently for their COVID-19 activities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Mark. And I think that's valid. I think in this discussion, there's quite a bit. Uh, it'll be useful to hear from um, others. I think I'll move on in a second to our next steps to know how we can continue any of those discussions. But to Mark, to your point, yeah, on the development and humanitarian, I think there are clear distinctions that can be made using other elements that are not, um, you know, COVID-19 specific. So I'll move us on to next steps, which is the important bit of like, where is this discussion leading us? And thanks to everyone for um, for bringing in your views and experience and uh, and sharing sharing what your challenges or what solutions and how you're working on this. And very much for you know all the input, because I think we do recognize it's a lot of hard work and it's it is a lot of you know we see and access the data but we understand it's quite it's quite a lot of teamwork within your organizations and being able to pull this together very quickly so that's been really really you know really successful and really great to see on the next steps so what we would want to do is very much uh, capture so as we said from the analysis what we will do is another post so sarah mentioned that the analysis is already out there but we would want in the upcoming week to uh, put another post on uh, you know, the data quality challenges and improvements needed. We will also do um, you know, a summary. I don't think on any of the discussions we've talked about, it was really useful to see you know, where there are challenges, you know, what are the views for some of the options. We wouldn't be directly reaching conclusions, but I think we'll update on what the discussions were and what the kind of pros and cons of some of those are. Uh, and whether there are there is a need for um, any uh, possible updates or improvements to the guidance going forward, um, and very much uh, yeah ongoing keeping an eye on the data, engaging with you, and please do um, share your feedback and stories. I think it's been great to see uh, a lot of activity, and you know we are getting questions from different data users as well on um, on the use of uh, IATI data, specifically on COVID-19. So there's plenty of opportunity for you to engage again through IATI Discuss or contacting us directly, directly or also contacting each other, I think, within different, uh, you know, different organizations, there's a lot of knowledge sharing uh, that can happen. Uh, but that's yeah, that's what I wanted to very much say to say a big thank you. We'll follow up and send you, uh, of course, the slides and uh, links to links to the analysis, and you can come back to us with uh, with any questions and do yeah, to share your stories because yeah, we're excited about the improvements, but there's been um, it's been quite exciting to see uh, the data that's already out there. So thanks everyone, and do keep in touch with us.